So we are going to talk about defining homomorphisms on quotients. This video is going to use the language of groups, but the same idea applies to other algebraic structures such as rings. So let's say we have a group G and a normal subgroup K of G. We can form the quotient group G mod K, and the elements of that quotient are cosets, which look like G times K, where little g is an element of the original group. Now let's say we want to define a homomorphism F that goes from the quotient group G mod K to some other group H. One way we can define such a homomorphism is to say, well, F, the elements of the quotient group, the domain of F, those are these cosets G times K. And when we take a coset, this element here, this little g, is called a representative of the coset g times k. It's a specific element of the coset that we choose to represent the entire set. So one way to define f of g times k is to just look at the coset representative and define f as a function of the representative. So to do this, we're essentially defining another homomorphism phi that goes from the original group G to that same codomain H, and then we're using this phi to define F in terms of the coset representatives. Now, if we define F in this way, if phi is a group homomorphism, then F defined like this is automatically also a group homomorphism. Because if we look at F of G1K times G2K, where G1 and G2 are elements of that group, in here, this G1K times G2K is the same as G1G2K. That's how multiplication in the quotient group is defined. And then, by definition, F of G1G2K, that's going to be phi of G1G2. And then, on the other hand, F of G1K times F of G2K, well, we can compute each of these individually using this definition. So F of G1K is phi of G1, and similarly, f of g2k is phi of g2. Now, because phi is a group homomorphism, phi of g1, g2 equals phi of g1 times phi of g2, which means that these two first expressions are equal, and therefore f is a group homomorphism. So, it seems like we're done. If we wanted to find a homomorphism on the quotient group g mod k, all we have to do is find a homomorphism on the original group g, and then use that to define a function on the cosets by just picking a coset representative and plugging that into phi. There's one problem here though, which is we don't know whether the function f is well defined. To see an example of where this problem comes from, let's take a look at the group of integers under addition. We can define a group homomorphism from the integers to itself by just taking phi of n equals n. This is the identity map on the integers. Of course, it's a group homomorphism. Now, if we take a look at the subgroup 5z, this is a normal subgroup of the entire group of integers z under addition. So this subgroup here is just the set of all integers that are multiples of 5. And we can construct the quotient group z mod 5z. So this is the integers mod 5. And using this construction, we could define a function f that goes from z mod 5z to the same codomain z. And the way we want to define that is by saying f of n plus 5z. This is our coset. And the definition here is that we just take the coset representative and apply phi to that. So phi of n. But phi of n is just equal to n. So take a second and see if you can figure out the problem with this definition of a function. f of n plus 5z equals n. The problem here is that n plus 5z is a coset that contains many different elements. So as an example, let's take a look at the coset 2 plus 5z. So this coset contains 2 plus every integer multiple of 5. So the elements are going to look like 2, 7, 12, 17, and then also in the reverse direction we'd have minus 3, minus 8, minus 13, and so on. But the key point here is that 2 plus 5z is the same coset as 7 plus 5z. Because if we take 2 and add all the multiples of 5, the set that we get 
is the same set that we would get if we start with 7 and then add all the multiples of 5. But if these are the exact same set, then we need to have f of 2 plus 5z being equal to f of 7 plus 5z. And that's not what we get with this definition, because f of 2 plus 5z is just 2, and f of 7 plus 5z is 7. But that doesn't make any sense, because these 2 plus 5z and 7 plus 5z, they're the same set. So we can't have a function that maps the same set to two different outputs. So let's take this problem back to the more general language of an arbitrary group. The problem here is that if we have some coset gk of a normal subgroup k, then we can also have a different coset representative. Let's say the first representative is g1 and the second representative is g2. So we're almost always going to have cases in a quotient group where there are two elements, g1 and g2, of that original group where g1k equals g2k. And if that's the case, then we need f of g1k to equal f of g2k. If we want to define a homomorphism on the quotient group in terms of a homomorphism on the original group g, then we're having f of g1k being equal to phi of g1, and then f of g2k is phi of g2. So in order for the function f to be well defined, we need to have that if g1k equals g2k, then phi of g1 equals phi of g2. So let's think a little bit more about what this equation here means. If g1k equals g2k, one thing we can do here is multiply both sides of the equation by g2 inverse on the left. So on the left side, we'll get g2 inverse g1k, and then on the right side, g2 inverse g2k is just k. Now, both sides of these equations, these are sets of elements in the original group g. So of course, this k on the right side is just that normal subgroup, but on the left side, g2 inverse g1k that's the set of all elements of the form g2 inverse times g1 times some element of the normal subgroup k. Now, in particular, k contains the identity element e of the original group. So g2 inverse g1 times the identity element, this is in g2 inverse g1k. This is part of that coset. And we know that g2 inverse g1k equals that normal subgroup k, which means that g2 inverse g1 times the identity is an element of k. Of course, the identity element doesn't do anything when we multiply, so this is telling us that g2 inverse g1 is an element of k. So this first equation, g1k equals g2k, that means that g2 inverse g1 is in that normal subgroup k. Now let's take a look at the second equation over here, phi of g1 equals phi of g2. Now in this case, phi of g1 and phi of g2, these are both elements of the second group h. So what I'm going to do is multiply by the inverse of this element, phi of g2, on both sides. So on the left side, we're going to get phi of g2 inverse times phi of g1. And then on the right side, phi of g2 inverse times phi of g2, that's just the identity element. But phi is a group homomorphism. So first of all, phi of g2 and then taking the inverse, that's the same as phi of g2 inverse. And then second of all, phi of g2 inverse times phi of g1 is the same as phi of g2 inverse g1. So those are just basic properties of the group homomorphism. So phi of g2 inverse g1 equals the identity. That's what this second equation is telling us. So the new form we have of the implication that we're looking for here is that if g2 inverse g1 is in k, then phi of g2 inverse g1 equals the identity. But notice in both cases here that this element here, g2 inverse g1, that's the same as what we're plugging into phi. So what we're really saying is that if we have some element of the group G that's in the normal subgroup K, 
then phi has to be the identity on that element of the group. That's the thing that we want in order for the homomorphism to be well-defined. So in other words, phi applied to any element of the normal subgroup K has to be the identity. So this is the condition that we need to check whether a homomorphism on the original group G gives us a well-defined homomorphism on the quotient group G mod K. We start with any homomorphism phi from G to H, and all we need to check is that phi gives us the identity on every element of that subgroup K. As an example of this condition, we can take a look at the homomorphism phi from the integers to itself given by phi of n equals n. In this case, we're considering the normal subgroup 5z. That's basically our k in this case. And one element of 5z, that's all the multiples of 5, is just the integer 5. But phi of 5 equals 5, and that's not the identity element of the integers. It's not 0. So this homomorphism phi does not satisfy this condition, which is why it doesn't give us a well-defined homomorphism on the quotient group z mod 5z. Next, I'll give an example of this condition working if you're familiar with the symmetric group and the sign of a permutation. So there's a group homomorphism sigma that goes from the symmetric group Sn to the set plus or minus 1. This set is a group under multiplication. And the homomorphism is defined by sigma of some permutation g equals the sine of g. So the sine of a permutation tells us the number of two cycles that are needed to create the permutation g. So if the number of two cycles that we need to create the permutation is even, then the sine of g is plus 1, and we say that g is an even permutation. Whereas if the number of two cycles that we need is odd, then we say that g is an odd permutation, and its sine is negative 1. So for example, the permutation 1, 2, 3, this is a 3 cycle, but we can write it as 1, 2 times 2, 3. So both 1, 2, and 2, 3 are 2 cycles. So this is writing the permutation as an even number of 2 cycles, which means that this is an even permutation. Now, the set of even permutations in the symmetric group actually forms a normal subgroup. It's called the alternating group AN. So it's a subgroup of index 2. And the point is that the sign of every element in the alternating group is plus 1, because by definition, this is the set of all even permutations. So it's the set of all things with sign 1, and plus 1 is the identity element of this group here. So every element of this normal subgroup gets sent to the identity by this map sigma, which means that we can use sigma to define a map f on the quotient Sn mod An to the group plus or minus 1. If we define f on some permutation g times an, this is a coset of the alternating group, if we define this as just sigma of that permutation g, then this gives us a well-defined homomorphism from sn mod an to the group plus or minus 1. Now, the reason that this idea of defining homomorphisms on a quotient is so important is that there are many important objects in math that are best defined as quotient groups, quotient spaces, quotient modules, or something like that. For example, if you're familiar with the tensor product of vector spaces, that is something that we often construct as a quotient space of a very big vector space, and then we take the quotient by a subspace generated by a bunch of different elements. So if we define the tensor product as this quotient, let's say a mod b, it can be very difficult to check whether a map from a mod b to some other vector space is well defined, because we don't know whether it's independent of the coset representative that we choose here. So a lot of the time, instead of defining a map directly on the tensor product, what we do is start by defining a map on the original group a, and then we verify that that map is zero on every element of this subspace b that we use to take the quotient. Because if the map on A is 0 on every element of B, then this automatically tells us that we get a well-defined map from A mod B to whatever other vector space we're interested in. So this is a key way that we can define homomorphisms on quotients.